probably about seven years ago, uh, Judy and I were sitting up on the bank there, just above the sheep, uh, to try and imagine what this new house, where it might be, and then what we could create. We designed the house kind of from two directions. So one was really looking about how it would sit in its landscape, in the garden, looking out into the field. So it's a case of working out where the sun was, where the view was, how the shapes of the existing trees and that kind of thing would orient you to, to kind of where you wanted to sit in the morning, lunchtime, afternoon. And we ended up with this slightly open L shaped because that sort of really captured a bit of uh, space on the southern side that opened out and looked down the field. So, so that was very much kind of looking at the wider site. Then we also designed the house from the from the, the small things. It's about uh, relationships, about emotional <laughs> stuff, and it's about things. It's about possessions and things you're going to let go of and things you want to keep and things you want to pass on. And so you walk in and it's a new house, but it feels like a house that really has been made for them. So having um, decided that we could move and that we would move, and that we'd found a bit of geography that could work and Tom started to work on planning permissions. He set us this fascinating creative task of going around the other house room by room and all the spaces in between the rooms, we had lots of corridors, and think about what are the functions and the objects that you want to keep to build a new house around. So in a sense, it makes downsizing just about, yeah, sh shedding the baggage that they don't need and having something that's new, fresh and much better. And they don't have to worry about the fact that the roof might leak or the windows will need painting or the heating bill is going to be terrifying. So one little thing as we walk around, we had an enormous dresser in the kitchen that was in the other house when we went there 30 plus years ago in a corner and we resurrected it and the kitchen here needed to be high enough to take the dresser with some jugs on the top because I have a lovely collection of jugs but I wanted low ceilings in the drawing room because I wanted it to be cosy. We did it very much through taking an inventory you know measuring things up and taking photographs and then through the early sketch designs you know very early on you start drawing things in. You need to see how you're going to live in that space, where furniture is, how chairs are arranged, where the windows are, all of that sort of thing. We can have one family at a time to stay, but we can't have all their relations, friends and everybody, which I was beginning to feel slightly drowned by occasionally. So here we have two bedrooms, um, two double bedrooms, one for Philip and me, one for guests, and then we have these lovely spaces. So up these, this amazing staircase, we have this loft where, which can become a den for children. It's just full of duvets and pillows and spiders. <laughs> and then we have this lovely bed sofa space and it makes the house have an atmosphere of being a holiday house, which I think in my big house when I was trying to be grown up and smart and have dinner parties and things like that, Somehow, I never th could be that relaxed. I also passionately believe that objects hold family memory, particularly fabric. So I made the curtains out of curtains that had been in the bedrooms of our daughters. The curtains become a sort of family tree. And I love that sense of continuity in the new. Increasingly, families don't go and sit in a dining room, except at Christmas and on birthdays. So having let go of a dining room, we decided we could perfectly happily eat in here. And this room becomes the, the heart of a family where you eat. I love cooking and baking and all the kids bake and cook with me. And because we have these wonderful sliding doors and a seamless floor that goes outside, we can extend the eating area through a lot of the year, certainly on dry days, to the outside. And actually then you also need to see what's happening outside. So often, so often you see a drawing of a house or you know, a building that's just floating in a sea of white paper. 
you need to know what's happening all the way around it to know if it's working or not. You, because you can't detach a house from its landscape or any, any building from, from its context. When designing the garden, uh, we were keen to have this ha-ha feature so that you get, when you're sitting on the patio or in the house, you can get this seamless view down the valley. And it is important really for us moving in to this house five years ago to have a division uh, between the two gardens. So this beach hedge you see here, the beginnings of a beach hedge, uh, shows the division between the two properties. The house Paul Mead where we used to live, you can just see up through the uh, across the lawn and uh, beyond the yew hedge there. What I realised in the old house that was other than having a chair by the arger, um, I didn't have a place to curl up in. So coming here, we decided we'd have two spaces out either side of the kitchen and Philip has a lovely study um, with amazing slidey doors. And then we have this drawing room uh, with amazing slidey doors. And because they go way into the wall, they can be far bigger than a traditional door, which gives a sense of open plan. When they're all open, here's the next one. We had to have two because in order to have a loo, you have to have a door between the loo and the kitchen. So we end up with this magical little space that the grandchildren call the three-door room that they hide in. If you've plenty of storage space, you just keep too much stuff that you never sort out. So having sorted it, um, we then found that there were really useful spaces under the stairs. We have our deep freeze and washing machine behind that blue check material, which came from Philip's family home about 50 years ago. I remember Philip saying to Tom one day, well, what about the workshop? Because the workshop is key to this property. Lovely big workshop where Philip stores all the gardening tools, um, carpentry tools, which have come through generations, all those sort of wonderful tools. And I remember Tom looking at Philip and saying, but this is the workshop. It will always be your workshop. We don't need two workshops. So here we are in a very untidy workshop, I'm afraid, but you can see all the tools hung up, barrows and other tools um, not very well hung up at the moment. Um, we don't need two mowing machines. That mower, which is hardly shared, I nearly do it all. <laughs> it's this thing about what can we share, and then Philip can pass skills on to the grandchildren. Mum often comes to me and says she just feels like I'm on holiday every day, um, which is it's a lovely thing to hear. Um, it's just a slightly magical spot looking down over the field. Um, and. You only get that if you really engage with how someone wants to live and really engage with the place and put those two things together. Yeah, just start that, start that conversation. Don't, don't think you need to work it all out yourself.